right, I'm going to start here with this uh, background. Welcome to uh, BransonOffGrid.com and that domain just comes over to my YouTube channel. I had uh, the last video I did on my channel was about this 48 volt uh, quant. <clears throat> so now I'm doing, that was about a year ago, so now I'm doing an update. Uh, I found some, you can go on uh, YouTube and, uh, you know, find a number of videos on these uh, quant, uh, or it's under nano flow cell. And this one is uh, kind of showing you what the, this is an R&D car, so, uh, but it's kind of showing you that it's a flow cell, it's a liquid, it's actually a, uh, it's called a liquid uh, bi-ion, so it's a salt water. Uh, and there's, this kind of showing you the setup, but this is their R, one of their R&D cars or whatever, where they're testing it out on the track and this, uh, uh, in, have a number of videos. But this one, I like this one, is it kind of showed you the inside of the car, showed you the tanks, and uh, if you go to their website, uh, we're going to do that here in just a second. It uh, you got some uh, new information on there. It, it appears, though, that the interesting thing there's your uh, you have a positive charged liquid and a negative charged liquid, and it says you get a, a thousand kilometers out of that uh, what's stored there in the back of the car. Now this is the uh, two-person uh, vehicle, and then they also have a four-person, four passenger. So says it goes a thousand kilometers on this charged uh, saltwater liquid. Uh, the biggest issue uh, that appeared to me is, you know, it's only 48 volts. It's the only low voltage, high performance car that I'm aware of. And there might be others later on, but uh, <clears throat> charging the liquid seems to be the problem. It seems like that what they're trying to uh, show you is that you you're gonna have to fill up the car kind of like at a gas station because they, they're talking about using even the same infrastructure. You would just put the salt water in your car, this liquid, and that's how you would uh, continue on. So that's good. It's uh, as good as a lithium ion battery as far as energy density, but it's a flow battery, very sustainable, uh, non-polluting and all that kind of thing. It has a lot of advantages to it, but the one thing I'm gonna show you in their article is that they're saying it needs to be done on a large scale. So obviously the charging is the whole issue. Uh, they're taking that liquid, con probably uh, connect, uh, collecting it back in tanker trucks and then taking it back to some uh, place, a power plant or whatever, uh, solar hopefully, and then they're charging the liquid and then reselling you the liquid basically. So I don't know. Uh, at any rate, that's the car. So let's go over and... Uh, Let's just go back over here. This uh, newest article is about six months old. A little nano flow cell doesn't work. So the whole problem is, is that uh, it's not able to do it on small scale. Now I was thinking, well, if it's 48 volts, then this would be great if we could just charge it off of our uh, solar systems. I do off-grid solar. And uh, all that, uh, just have to have the right, uh, you know, take our solar panels, have to have the right uh, charge controller, in other words, uh, to charge it, but that's uh, not how it works. Uh, apparently you can't charge it necessarily in the car and all that, and the procedure for charging, it's a problem. But he talks about in his article here on the uh, website is, uh, by the way, here's their website, nanoflowcell.com, and you can uh, have press releases and you can, uh, find uh, a lot of stuff. It, it appears that their uh, company is in Switzerland and they're driving around Switzerland. So they have two different cars they're driving around there now testing. And he's answering, you know, how close it is to market readiness. It really just uh, comes down to uh, having someone uh, buy the technology and install the uh, charging system, which seems to be the, uh, the big thing. But he gets down here in this article and he talks about, uh, let's just stay here near the end. Talks about off-grid, so you could use it as a, a storage, like a regular battery in a sense, and then use it as storage for electricity, even though uh, that's probably not what they really intend, intend it to be used for. It could be used for that purpose, so it could be used in an off-grid situation. Uh, free themselves from the general electricity grid and all that kind of thing, uninter uninter interrupted power supply. He talks about off-grid versus grid tile and all that kind of thing. So 
but apparently uh, they still need the liquid back and then they, however they, it takes to recharge it, and they have to have a specific facility for recharging it. So apparently it's gonna have to be done on a large scale. So I thought, you know, there's, and, and they've already sold uh, 3 billion euros worth of cars or whatever. And they're not really uh, uh, talking about who got those cars. So I'm thinking, you know, the perfect uh, place, uh, and I wonder if I even brought it up here. Oh, here it is. Neom. The, here's the place that I'm thinking. Neom. Now, most people don't know where Neom is, but it's a city being built in Saudi Arabia. And if you go over there and look at their uh, website, uh, well, I thought it already had their website brought up. At any rate, N-E-O-M. Uh, well, here you go. Let's just do this. I thought I had the page. I guess I closed the page and went to that. So anyway, here's their website. It's a place in Saudi Arabia. And the interesting thing is, uh, most people might not have heard of Neom yet, but you're going to. And let's just scroll down here and look at their map of Neom. Well, they show, uh, here's what I was thinking it was gonna take to, this is a heliostat with mirrors and they're melting either uh, sand or they're melting salt. And then they use that, uh, uh, yeah, it's probably a thousand degree uh, if you're melting salt. And they store that in a container and then they use that heat to boil water and do it, use a steam turbine. So it's a lot like uh, the way we already do it in, in a sense, except for the salt storage or the uh, liquid sand, and they might do sand uh, in Neom. But they're doing a big uh, off-grid uh, city there. Let's just scroll down because there's a picture of it here of where it is and how big it is, which will be the interesting part. And where is it? Oh, there it is. All right. So, you know Saudi Arabia. There's the Sinai Peninsula. And if you're familiar with Mount Sinai in Exodus and the Bible, it's supposedly Mount Sinai is right down here somewhere near the bottom. It's approximately right here. Now, this is the uh, this Mount Sinai is where uh, supposedly all the Israelites escaped to. So supposedly they, uh, and I'm telling you this for a reason, they uh, were over here in Egypt, a little bit higher than where our map is, and they came across uh, where the Suez Canal is, approximately right here. It's not that much off this map here. And they came down, and supposedly they went to Mount Sinai, and then they walked around out here in this little bit area, and a few million Israelites, for... Uh, 40 years and uh, and then they went up to Israel. Well, the problem with that is, is that's not what happened. Now, back in the 80s, uh, this guy, uh, Ron Wyatt, was doing some biblical uh, research and figured out that uh, Mount Sinai, according to Exodus and Genesis and other books, it was actually over here at Galatians, uh, was actually over here in Arabia, which is what the Bible says, and him and his son snuck in. And Mount Sinai, I believe, uh, this is probably it right here, right where this little dark area, and then Mount Oreb would be here uh, just above it. So I, I'm pretty sure it's probably about right there. He figured out that they come over here because this is the land of Midian. From here on down, approximately, uh, maybe as far down as the bottom, uh, around through here, this whole area here is was called Midian. And... Uh, so the Midianites came from this area. <clears throat> so interesting thing is they found out about this in 84 and then they did research into it and figured out that this really was the uh, correct Mount Sinai. And it's very easy if you're there and we now have good drone footage on YouTube. You can just go up to YouTube and look for Mount Sinai, the real Mount Sinai, that kind of thing. And you'll find uh, this all of this video showing you this uh, Mount Sinai. In fact, I'm going to do some of my own so you might find one that I did. But uh, you'll find all this new video. And when you look at the video, you can realize that this is a real Mount Sinai. Everything you read in Exodus is still there. So what the uh, Saudis actually did was they basically uh, fenced off this area and uh, protected all these artifacts around Mount Sinai. And now they're going to, in this area where you see this line, this is going to be the city of Neom. Now, I don't know how many. This is a big area. They say it's uh, 13 times the size of New York uh, City, I believe. So uh, it's pretty big. And this is going to be all off-grid with solar and the latest technology. They're going to have robots. And I'm thinking 
they're probably the ones that bought these uh, saltwater cars from uh, NanoFlow Cell, more than likely. It would just make perfect sense because they're going to be all state of the art here uh, and they would be the, the right purchaser for it. So it's just my speculation, but at any rate, this uh, Mount Sinai is going to be known, and uh, eventually all these scholars are going to start telling you, yeah, it's over here. It's not over here where they were, said it was. It, it just that, that came from way back around Charlemagne's time or something like that, about 1000 AD or something. Uh, they said, oh, it's here. So everybody just embraced that. But in fact, if you go over here, because first of all, you got to have the burning bush, you got to have almond trees almond trees don't grow over there well, almond trees don't grow over here however they do grow at mount sinai and the burning bush is there and the uh this all everything everything you read next is still there you can physically see it and they protected all these artifacts so now they're opening up uh, the country and inside this area by the way i think there's going to be another economic area or something uh, this is going to be maybe the entertainment area. They're going to invite people to live here. They're going to build condos, homes, I don't know, all types of things. It's going to be a big city. Uh, $500 billion investment into this. And uh, they've already started. They've got an airport. They've got a number of things already here. Uh, <clears throat> we haven't heard a whole lot about it, but you, you, like I said, you will hear about it. And then eventually the Christian people will start coming over here to the real Mount Sinai. And then they'll, when they see everything that they see and uh, read about in Exodus, uh, is still here, uh, the golden calf altar and all that kind of stuff. It's all here. A uh, writing still on the uh, rocks of the original Paleo Hebrew. Everything you would expect to see from the Bible is here at the real Mount Sinai, and it's black on top as it's supposed to be. So, in fact, right here, uh, if we could zoom in, you can see it's really good. This is where they came across this little blip right here. It actually came from up here. Uh, there's a, a road across that's kind of at the top of these two. Uh, and these are both the Red Sea, by the way. So the Gulf of Aqaba was just called, this is the Gulf of Aqaba, it was just called the Red Sea back then. So at any rate, they came across the Red Sea over here, uh, which is really the Suez Canal. And then they went across it. And then they turned, uh, and that's in Scripture, and they came down. And they came across this, uh, to this beach landing area at Nueva. And that's where they stopped at the Red Sea, and then the Red Sea was parted. And it's a high spot because all this uh, area around in this water here is very deep, except for this one little spot right here where they came across. So it's real interesting when you look at all the videos on this, and, all, and a lot of this is new. So you should, you should really look at uh, videos that have to do with Mount Sinai that have been posted within the last couple of years. That's the new stuff. And there's some uh, other good uh, videos that was... Uh, shot back in the uh, 1990s by uh, the Caldwells, which actually lived and worked here at one of the uh, plants here in Saudi Arabia and came over here on their vacation and basically shot a uh, video back in the 90s. And that's interesting to look at. Uh, but the newest stuff, the drone footage, the 4K uh, drone footage, is really, really good stuff to, to see. And you can just see what's here in, in such great detail. You can understand, yeah, everything you read about is here. So. It will be embraced uh, very soon. Uh, in fact, the scholars will lose their credibility if they don't uh, admit that this is where it is. And then that changes everything. Uh, it doesn't just change all the maps in your Bible, which are wrong or showing that Sinai is over here. It changes all the locations that are based on where Mount Sinai is. Now this, that's what I'm doing my videos on, to show what all it changes, because in fact, uh, the Israelites, when they got over here, they actually worship uh, Yehoah, which is Christ in the New Testament. So uh, this idea that Christ is not in the Old Testament, yes, he's in Genesis, and that's what I'm going to be teaching. So I just wanted to see that. Uh, so I'm thinking, you know, that's uh, for an off-grid area. And the whole other idea of off-grid, uh, like the man says, let's go over here and uh, go back to, oh, that's blue sky. All right. Well, I guess I've closed it already. Uh, what he was saying uh, is that uh, we need to be, uh, I'm going to show you these uh, drones here, or air, air taxis is what I should say. But we can do off-grid, and actually uh, it's cheaper if we do it with enough people. We just doing individual homes is the absolute worst way to do off-grid uh, energy. 
one house at a time because you have to buy so many batteries. You gotta have all this extra power so you can absolutely run off grid. You gotta have a lot of a lot of extra power. If you're running 30 kilowatt hours or 30, 40 a day, which is easy to do in a typical home, well now you gotta store uh, three to four times that. If you really wanna be off grid, you gotta store a lot more or you're gonna have a generator run it a lot and that kind of thing. So the cost of the system for a single house is high. However, if you hook 10 homes together, then you can go with a commercial battery storage and one generator for all 10 homes instead of, you know, you understand. So it just works a lot better. You can be off grid with uh, maybe as little as 10 homes and it's, it can be cheaper than the energy you're, buying, you're already paying for it if you do it that way. Getting people to do that is the hard part, getting them to come together. Now, if you look at the uh, saltwater battery on uh, the website here, uh, or the YouTube channel, Branson Off Grid, and it just says Branson Solar. I don't know why they had to reload because I saw I loaded all this stuff to begin with. At any rate, uh, I've got an intro, actually it's on the intro. Uh, I show uh, the Branson Off Grid Solar intro. This is the Aquion saltwater battery. And that holds 30 uh, kilowatts of power. So you can download this, just go to my home link and it's uh, on the list. But uh, <clears throat> I've got uh, a number of videos about that. Uh, one, and here's the, probably a good one. It kind of shows the, how it's all wired together, how the whole system uh, you would wire up a, an off-grid. And then I show on here that you can uh, power and uh, plug in something like electric motorcycle or I've got a picture of a Tesla and I show some charge stations and all that and how that would all just tie in and you could be off grid. <clears throat> so uh, I've got this uh, videos of uh, my EV on here and showing my Polaris uh, Ranger which I've had now for about uh, almost 10 years and uh, <clears throat> really it's kind of started out how this video is going to be about uh, my uh, uh, I've got my last video was eight years of use. Now I'm uh, over nine years of use, and I had some noise issues. Uh, it's not really not a big deal, just some clicking. When you're in an EV, the EV is so quiet that any little bit of noise is noise. Anything, uh, brake squeal or any little thing, just you, you notice it right off the bat. Uh, where if you had a gasoline engine running, you wouldn't hear any of the things you hear with an electric vehicle. It's just the way it is. Well, until you get into uh, dry leaves or you know, rocks and all that kind of thing, and gravel, then it makes the same noise that anything else makes. But other than that, you're gonna notice a lot of stuff. So I had a little bit of a shimmy in the motor, <clears throat> which I think is just a, uh, because of the high amp draw when you first uh, uh, take off, uh, you have a, a, most of your amp draw is right then. As soon as you take off in the first couple of seconds and it was stumbling, and I think that's really just a, uh, Problem with the way the, the controller in it is programmed. I put some new batteries in it, but it really didn't change it a little bit. It did improve it a little bit, but not as much as I had hoped. And then the splines in the rear end uh, apparently make a little bit of racket. And, you know, it's, let's face it, it's 10 years old. So, whatever. But other than putting batteries in the thing, I haven't uh, really done anything to it. So it's well worth the money and now, uh, you can buy uh, this Ranger EV in an electric version, uh, excuse me, a lithium ion version, uh, get lithium ion batteries, but they only put batteries on like half of the side. They don't use the whole area for batteries, so you really only get uh, the same range as you would, and you pay a little bit more uh, for it, but now you have lithium ion, which is fine. I like that idea. I wish they would uh, let you add a second set of lithium ions so you actually maybe get 100 miles of range out of it, even though obviously it would cost another $5,000 probably. <clears throat> that would have been a great idea. <clears throat> and uh, and uh, just go ahead and make it so you could plug it into a, uh, uh, you know, your solar panels and give you the right charge controller and all that, which is what I'm doing. Uh, the good thing with the lithium uh, uh, ion is, you know, the batteries are going to last a lot longer. The good thing with the lead acid is I can just plug it into one of these charge controllers that are already programmed for lead acid, and all I got to do is just plug it in. So, real simple. In fact, there's my plug on this video. You can kind of see it right there, plugged in. DC, DC charging, my EMI from solar. 
and I just plug it right into a charge controller. So I just borrow that. <coughs> Unplug it from my battery bank, walk over here, plug it into this, which is just a, a different battery bank, and off it goes. A couple of hours, it's charged up. So, uh, yeah, we should really be doing a lot of these things, and we're not, but uh, I show people how to do that on a regular basis. All right, so let's get off that, and uh, the idea about the battery then, uh, the Aquion went out of business. However, now there's this company in, uh, and they call it the Green Rock Saltwater Battery. It's the same technology it appears to be. Let's put it this way. It appears to be, I've looked at the specs, it appears to be the same basic uh, battery, and it's in stacks, and you can see the stacks here. Uh, well, except if you <laughs> highlight them, they go away. And they're in green instead of black, but uh, and then they wire up completely different. The Aquion, all this was, all these stacks were already in a module that had 30 kilowatts of storage, and your fuses and your wiring it was all just already in there, which was kind of a nice setup. Where here they, they're kind of showing it in individual stacks, so it's a lot bigger and <clears throat> a lot more complicated because you're having to put everything together yourself. Where uh, Eventually, maybe they'll make it all in a module setup. In fact, if you download some of their uh, PDFs off their site here, which is bluesky-energy.eu, and they're in, uh, they're actually in uh, the company is in Germany, uh, but where they build them is in Austria, and now they're shipping them to the U.S. out of. Uh, Idaho and Sandpoint, Idaho, they have a distributor. So you can buy them. I didn't check the pricing to see if they're uh, cheaper, but you can call them. You can find uh, their distributor <coughs> and uh, just go here and check them out. If you're looking for that technology, it's uh, now available again. In fact, I think they list it. Uh, well, they list a number of things here. I was thinking they had the one because I did actually get it off of their website, but not on their front page. It must have got it from somewhere else. Oh, there it is. L Gold. Okay, this is the guy right here, L Gold 608. So this is Idaho. That's their uh, email for the guy, L Gold at Blue Sky Energy. And he's the one in Idaho, and that's his phone number. And then somewhere on here is his address and everything. And they do have a... Uh, Wow, I don't know why this thing is having to redo everything I've already done every time I click on something. They do have a uh, YouTube site here, Blue Sky Energy. And of course, it's uh, got this link with all this uh, characters in it. So you just have to remember uh, Blue Sky Energy is the name of their uh, channel. And they've got some recent uh, webinars. I've watched these kind of show you uh, a little bit about uh, off-grid systems. Like this last one's kind of showing you the uh, duct curve and how the battery fills in. And uh, for off-grid or, or a grid tie, either way, they show pictures of the batteries and so forth. And then in one of their, uh, I don't know if it's in any of their videos, here they show the individual stacks. So it looks, the battery, like I said, looks identical to mine. It just, it's all, uh, you're having to do the wiring and do the breakers and doing everything yourself instead of that buying it in one uh, self-contained unit. And then their uh, units are like two batteries at a time. So, and then you, so whatever. But uh, that's the one thing that most people ask most about is this uh, saltwater battery. If it's still available, and yes, it is. You can get it uh, out of Idaho. And there's all the information you need. So, uh, Neom, the interesting thing about this city uh, that they're building here, uh, they don't, it looks like everything they've got on their YouTube channel has to do with sports. And all this, of course, is new. Well, it goes back two years old, but uh, it appears that it all pretty much has to do with sports. It doesn't really uh, have much on their city. But if you go to neom.com, uh, the interesting thing is they're going to be doing uh, air taxis. So, I want to show you some of this. Uh, technology because these all these air taxis are electric and uh, there is a individual uh, electric vehicle now that you'll be able to buy and I thought you would want to see that for sure 
the video, you can look at all these with eHang e because they're already flying these around. Uh, trial flights across cities. This is probably a good one to watch here, two minutes. And I think this one showed it flying across from point to point on this video here. So you can go look through some of these videos and, uh, oh. It's got eHang. Well, you can go to their uh, website, eHang.com. Actually, oh, there it is. Yeah. Well, I thought I already had that open, but I guess I didn't. At any rate, uh, these air taxis are already uh, in the business. As far as I know, uh, you can actually fly. They're actually flying in New Zealand, from what I heard. Uh, they're one of the first places to actually you can go and rent an air taxi and fly to place to place. <coughs> they uh, probably have a page here where they show, oh, well, they show uh, aerial media, so that's probably pictures. And these will fly probably about four people at a time and up to uh, 30 minutes or so is probably the best we have today. However, there is a lot of people working on the uh, battery technology. And uh, that's going to get better, but they're already flying them. So uh, you're going to see this. In fact, uh, let's just go over. Uh, they're already signed up to fly them in Neom in Saudi Arabia is what I was trying to get at. And this Volocopter is already, uh, it's already just flown uh, in Germany, I think. Volocopter flies for the first time in European city. Yeah, it was uh, at the Mercedes-Benz uh, uh, headquarters, I guess, where they flew it. And there was over, a, uh, over the water uh, outside that building, and they were flying it over there as a demonstrator. So at any rate, that's an interesting uh, video to watch. So... The good thing is, and this one I think is set up to fly four people as well. So you're going to see this new technology, and the good thing is uh, you'll be able to just charge these up and continue flying, and uh, they're here. So uh, there's probably 20 companies with some type of drone technology for flying uh, people uh, already in the works, but there's at least two or three that are already flying, and there's a, a Pipistrelle. Gee, I forget where that is. Oh, I guess that's uh, Australia, and they have an electric uh, airplane. And there's a number. We have a whole show, and I believe that's in Germany, that's just electric airplanes. And you'd be amazed if you knew how many airplanes there are today that actually uh, run on batteries. It's amazing. Uh, well, this is play video. I don't want to do that. But that's kind of a picture of the drone. This is a first personal flying drone experience for everyone. Now, you can sign up to fly this called a HEXA. And this is out of Austin, Texas, and this company is making an ultralight, as you can see, single person drone with a pod so you can land it in the water. <clears throat> and uh, I think it has a ballistic chute on the top right here and all that kind of thing. And I think they're going to be asking, I think they're pushing the idea of about $200,000. Well, you can buy ultralight uh, airplanes for maybe as low as $40,000. So. You know, most people, I've been flying ultralights for since the 80s. I used to build those things a long time ago. So, you know, it's a great idea, though, to be uh, able to take off and land straight up and down. So this is vertical takeoff and landing. That's just a huge thing. So there's so many companies working on different types. But uh, as far as I know, uh, they have this uh, available or will have it available actually to buy. And it's an ultralight, so you won't need a pilot's license, which is the... Uh, unique thing about ultralights. Now they have to fit a specific uh, classification uh, and that's like 254 pounds so it's not a lot. Can't put a whole lot of batteries in here if you only got 254 pounds and of course it's all going to be very lightweight, extremely uh, lightweight carbon fiber and all that kind of stuff. So that's why it costs so much. Uh, weight is a real issue. So, But you have multi-rotor and all that kind of thing so there's a lot of uh, backup uh, uh, usually you run multiple battery packs multiple controllers in case something fails and all that kind of thing so it's a great thing and what you can do though is you can sign up uh, if I don't know what the current price is here it is join the wait list uh, bring it to your city yeah so they're gonna actually be flying these and you can sign up for uh, 
Well, I signed up for $150. That's been months ago. I don't know if that's still the going rate. Uh, the normal rate was supposed to be $250. And uh, you can go and, and fly it. If you uh, sign up for it, just go here on the website, liftaircraft.com. And here is their YouTube channel. I guess it's going to have to load again. So I was actually going to show their uh, video because it, it actually shows it flying. It's not much, but uh, you can see it's just a joystick control. And they're going to, oh, wow. Now it's got to play everything again. Well, <laughs> all right, here it is. Now with the floats, you get a, uh, an adder on uh, weight for floats on uh, ultralight aircraft, and you get an adder for weight for a ballistic chute, so you can be over 254 pounds. So uh, I don't know what the actual weight is on it, but it's still uh, gonna be classified as an ultralight. As you can see, it's just a joystick control. They got this one, Geofence, but basically this is what you'll be flying. For $150, you'll be, you'll be able to go out and fly it for anywhere from about eight to 15 minutes inside a geofenced area. So in other words, uh, they'll be able to take control over it from the ground and fly it if you can't and all that kind of thing. And you'll only be able to fly it in a very uh, small, probably about the size of a football field or something like that. And that's as, as far as it'll let you go, but you'll be able to get it and fly it. So. It's a neat thing for 150 bucks. Uh, get you a little video of your flight, and uh, you could be one of the first people in America to actually fly an electric uh, air taxi, in a sense, but it'll be an electric ultralight. And uh, buy one if you can uh, stomach the $200,000 for it. <coughs> uh, right now, the electric aircraft that's available, uh, you could probably buy a lot of those for $200,000 but you can't uh, vertically take off and that's what's uh, such a great thing with that. So at any rate, that was gonna be my update for today and uh, just show you that uh, there's a lot going on in the electric field and uh, we have new battery technology and we could spend uh, hours and hours and hours talking about batteries and it wouldn't do you any good because it doesn't, no one knows what's gonna get funded in, uh, in battery technology, but there's a lot of new battery technology that's being worked on and what comes out and what doesn't, who knows. Uh, if this quant apparently is gonna be on the road and where it's gonna be on the road, uh, no one's uh, really saying so. There's a lot of exciting things, and then this city over here and all this information coming out about Saudi Arabia and how that ties to Mount Sinai, that's just crazy, but within the next couple of years, it's going to be the rage, so uh, you heard it here first, and uh, I wish there were more people doing uh, electric off-grid uh, systems instead of the uh, grid tie. Uh, we could all be uh, making our own power. It's just not that hard. <coughs> Uh, the electric uh, motorcycle thing, uh, if you look at the zero motorcycles uh, for 2020, they've added a new model. Uh, they've got a little bit more range on them. They're touting up to, uh, I think, a 200 mile range on their uh, biggest, uh, whatever. You can look at zero motorcycles if you're into motorcycles. And here's an old one I did on my uh, EV. We're a prepper group explaining how uh, you know, all about the, uh, so I'll scroll down my channel and then this one will be up here as soon as uh, we get uh, finished with it. So thank you for visiting and uh, hey, I'm almost up to 500 subscribers. So send out my uh, BransonOffGrid.com uh, to other people that you might think are interested and we'll push solar technology, off-grid especially. Oh, so there's the, uh, back of it and that's and the interesting thing about that one is you can see how small those tires are they look like they're 20s but uh they're very uh thin so they'd be like a 190 80 20 i guess very yeah, see that right there very uh very thin tires but you know so it doesn't have much road resistance all right well thanks for watching